we are here. Uh, welcome back. Glad you're here. On the screen, because lots of people were asking about it after last night, which made us think we should have put it up before, but uh, is Mark's uh, podcast from Fuller Studios, Conversing. Uh, if you want to check that out, he gets a ton of interesting guests, and he's a very, very good interviewer. And then uh, I, I put up four of his books, uh, the first three that he wrote, the last one that he was an editor, the editor for. So if you want to uh, peek at that, you can do that. Uh, also had people asking about uh, recording. So we are, we are not live streaming these sessions, but we are recording them. If you are a Cove person, you will get an email tomorrow morning reminding you not to come here for worship tomorrow. Uh, but it will also have links to these two sessions. Uh, it will also be on the Cove website, and I don't know who the First Pres person is, but I bet it'll be on, uh, put on the First Pres website as well. So uh, the only other thing I want to remind you of is worship uh, together tomorrow at First Presbyterian over on Pacific, and that is at nine. The third, no, nine o'clock and ten thirty. Nine o'clock and ten thirty. Okay. So without anything else, I think we've covered everything. Uh, please welcome up again, Mark Laberton. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for those who are here, uh, as you were last night. I don't, don't take it for granted that people return the next day. So thank you for returning. Grateful for your presence. Uh, and uh, I think I'd like to begin with taking a moment to read a psalm that in some ways, I think, holds uh, a lot of what we were talking about last night. It's a familiar psalm, um, Psalm 73, um, and it, it holds the rigor that I think we are experiencing and that we were trying to uh, point to last night. So let's just take a moment to be quiet for a second, just to sort of focus our minds. <clears throat> Truly, God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pain, their bodies are sound and sleek, they are not in trouble as others are, they are not plagued like other people. Therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out with fatness, their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heavens, and their tongues range over the earth. Therefore the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Such are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and am punished every morning. If I had said, I will walk on in this way, I would have been untrue to the circle of your children. But when I thought about how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I perceived their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, they are like a dream when one wakes. On awaking, you despise their phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a brute beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will receive me with honor. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire more than you. 
My flesh and my heart shall fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Indeed, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge to tell of all your works. Oh God, as we come to the start of the new day and the beginning of this time we spend together this morning, we receive this word from the psalmist, an honest telling in naked dignity of what it means to be struggling people who see what we see but realize that we don't see so much that we don't see and that we know that we don't see and that we don't know that we don't see. And in all of that, there is the wonderment of then entering into your presence. It seemed a wearisome task to consider all this until the psalmist moved into the sanctuary of God. So Lord, today as we are wanting to remember that we dwell in the sanctuary of God, not because we're in a church building this morning, but because we're in Christ. There we, therefore, we dwell in you. And it is in your presence that we are meant to find the, the keys, the clues, the lines of orientation, the reality, the hope that grounds us in a spinning world that is everything, everywhere, all at once. So much that we can't explain and do not understand, so much injustice and suffering that tyrannizes lives, even as we are here gathered in a warm place, a dry place, a place with food and almost enough coffee. We thank you, O oh God, that in that place, right here, for no reasons particularly apart from your abundant grace, that we get to be able to be in your presence. As we continue to think about these themes this morning, may your spirit guide us to dwell here as we move about our days, our children, our family, our friends, our neighborhoods, our strangers, the, en the enemies that are around us, the people who perplex us and assault us audibly, if not otherwise. So God, in your mercy, May we dwell in your presence, knowing that because we are in your presence, all manner of things will be well. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is it that we just did just then? <laughs> what was that thing that we just did right now? Turn to your neighbor and say, what, what was that that just happened? Okay, so uh, just again to invite a little more conversation two way rather than just one way, what, what, how would you describe what we just did? In those opening moments. We refocused, right? We refocused. <coughs> we refocused in particular on the Lord. How else would you describe it? Rebooting. In what way? Sort of expand that metaphor. Yes, right, right. I love that. Is it Annie Dillard who just says everyone does better by occasionally rebooting or replugging that kind of starting again? And part of the rhythm of our life in Christ does need to be rebooted. Uh, we're rebooted partly by rest. Our memories are 
brains are rebooted, our bodies are rebooted by sleep, but we also reboot by actually, in a certain sense, just acknowledging the problem and then stepping into the presence of God, not stepping away from the problem. Did you notice that? Not exactly stepping away from the problem. No, the problem is actually the problem. But there's more than the problem that's at play. And what's at play is a God who understands that problem. A God who sees it, knows it, understands it, does not make us make little of us in that kind of, oh, this is just a stupid day when I thought stupid things. He, the psalmist does say that. That's an inclination that we have. It's actually, but in the book of, of Job, where this is exaggerated to the maximum extent, where Job and his friends are railing against God uh, in a further uh, example of wisdom literature that's kind of the cross current. Wisdom literature that says if you do good, good happens. If you do bad, bad happens to you. Then the countervailing wind inside the dialogue of the canon itself is literature like Psalm 73 or like the book of Job, which says, no, but what happens when actually I do good and bad happens to me? I'm suffering. And you're saying that the world is going to turn out well. I actually look and see the bad people I seem to be doing just fine. But people like me who are trying to actually be faithful, I'm suffering in the middle of all this. So what is the deal? Matt, Job puts that to the ultimate biblical test. Apart from the cross, that's probably the most dramatic uh, high point, really, in, in this, this kind of tension. And, and in both cases, God does not curse Job. God recontextualizes Job. Who were you? Where were you when I made the world, right? In the, out of the whirlwind, God reframes and renames the reality. But then he actually commends and blesses Job. It's his friends that he actually extends a greater judgment toward. The friends who were so absolutely sure, perfectly sure, that they knew just exactly what all of the suffering of Job was really about. He was suffering so clearly he had done wrong, and Job kept saying, I am suffering, but I did not do wrong. And in that context, God reframes Job's vision. Let's just remember that you're the creator, the creature, I am the creator. But let's also remember that I bless you for being a faithful creature, which included asking hard questions, included crying out in genuine, honest, naked dignity before God, saying, this is the story of my life. This is the torment or challenge that I'm living with. So I say all these things because today I want us to be talking really, in a, in the overarching theme, I would say, is freedom. Where and how do we find the freedom that is meant to be ours as people of faith, living in this world where we could so easily be bound, right? 10,000 advertisements a day apparently cross our eyes one way or another or our ears in some way almost any given day. 10,000 forms of people that say, be bound to this anxiety, be bound to this uh, lack of something that you should really have, be bound to eat and experience this kind of food or go to that particular kind of place or experience this kind of uh, event or whatever it might be. And in the context, it's always being bound to neediness. Get your needs up and center, and then this ad is going to tell you what's going to satisfy that, right? And we're meant to live as consumers in a world bound to the consuming life in which we just need to plug the thing that someone's offering us in order to play better in the world. It just turns out that just is absolutely not how it works. But we're, we are connected, hooked by the belief that we do think those kinds of things can actually satisfy the next diet, the next experience, the next uh, form of, of human desire that we're seeking to have fulfilled. So the question then becomes, how do we actually find ourselves unhooked? So right now, there's plenty of people around the country, around the world, but let's just focus on the United States, plenty of people around the country who are hooked by various kinds of cable television. So you take that as a form of really cultural and sometimes personal addiction. And we get wired in to a particular way of understanding the world as presented through whatever cable service anyone particularly prefers. And in the context of that, we, it feeds to us a narrative that tells us implicitly and explicitly 
this is who you are. This is what's actually important. These are the people whose voices you should really hear and trust, and not those people whose voices you should absolutely not hear and hopefully not trust because of whatever reasons those are rejected. And in the context of all that, we spin people into a tighter and tighter, tighter news cycle where it's not just they're on the news cycle, but we're in a very particular shaped, constructed, curated news cycle in which we now hold the events of the day framed as they are by the media in whatever way that occurs. Now this can happen in so many different ways, subtle and far from subtle. So how do we get ourselves unhooked from that? What does Christian freedom actually mean? What does it mean to be people like the people of Israel? who understand the physical uh, realities of being enslaved to Egypt for 400 years and are then brought into freedom. That movement from bondage to freedom is a very significant theological movement. And part of what is, uh, is happening is, is that great movement as it continues in the New Testament. When Jesus continues to say, but you are bound to death, you're bound to things that kill, and you're not, as it were, enslaved, given over to what will actually be the source of life. So how do we come to aware awareness? What happens in Psalm 73 is that he's lost in the swirl of the narrative that he has painted about the problem of evil, why the righteous people suffer and, the, and evil people thrive. And it took some narrative work and some theological practice and some genuine effort to then say, wait, I'm going to re frame this, or I'm going to allow this to be reframed by the God who just holds a much bigger story. That was what we were talking about last night. So the first movement is, how do we get to name reality? Max Dupree was the, was the head of the Herman Miller Company and was the chairman of Fuller's board for many years. Remarkable, remarkable man. And at one stage, he, uh, he wrote uh, a little his, his favorite favorite aphorism that's often quoted is, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. So if we were to each say that each of us are leaders in the spheres of life that we live in, whatever circumstance, we might just be leading ourselves, or we might be leading our family, or we might be leading, uh, you know, et cetera, whatever responsibilities we might have professionally or otherwise. So whatever we're doing, we have a certain management role, leadership role, vision casting role, and therefore reality defining role. So what is the reality that we are laying hold of for ourselves and for those that are around us? What is that reality that is the primary reality? And what this Psalm 73 is saying, what Max Dupree is saying in, in his book uh, on leadership, is that if the first task of a leader is to define reality, and he says the last task of a leader is to say thank you. What he's aware of in holding on to these two things is saying there is this, this energy, synergy that exists between willfulness and gratitude. So it's not a delusional power that just names things like, again, like Napoleon crowning himself, just asserting something in the world. There are plenty of people who lead in exactly that way. A lot of the popularity of dictatorships in the world right now and authoritarianism as it, as it is only growing in the world is people who are more than happy to tell you exactly what is real. It just turns out that it's based on a fiction, that they are wise and that what they're telling you is even true. So the question from a Christian faith point of view is really how do we ourselves define reality and from what source are we understanding reality? And how does our Christian community help reinforce a deeper, richer, fuller, more, more capable uh, definition of reality so that we live into that, not into the fiction that's created by media that's actually trying to sell us something on the side or not so on the side. So we really have to be careful because we live in an era where this reality depiction is going on continuously by people who are claiming to have the truth, perspectives, etc. Even at this very moment as I speak these words, I am doing that myself toward you in relationship to my understanding of what I think the Bible is telling us is what's true and what's real. But plenty of preachers, including ones that were quoted in the, in the press this week, uh, who are scandalously racist, scandalously abusive of toward the, in their attitudes toward women, 
scandalously offensive, I would say, to the reality of the character of the God whose name they use to say, and this is what God would really want for you. Incredibly abusive. So even religious speech, sometimes especially religious speech, can be guilty of misnaming reality. This is where we have to keep coming back again and again in independency. This is why the psalmist finds such freedom, that key word for this morning, such freedom in being in the presence of God, not meaning hanging out in the church all the time. That's some people's vision of what Christian freedom looks like. That's actually not what's being talked about here. Just come to the church all the time. Let's just all move in here. It seems pretty spacious. There's room for everybody. We have, could lay down on the floor because half the chairs we could stay here. Showers might be more complicated. But in any case, we could decide that the church is a holy huddle where really we only experience and we must be in a certain place at a certain time to do certain things in order to experience God. Not true. In this case, it probably does involve the temple. So it's fair to acknowledge that that's probably part of what the psalmist is referring to. But we would now understand the temple to be the body of Christ. And we are the temple. So we don't have to go someplace to be in the sanctuary of God. We are part of the sanctuary of God. And as God dwells with us, then that actually frames everything else. If we actually practice and live into this, right? So this is why I would say that the number one crisis in the church in America and probably many places around the world is actually the basic crisis of, of Christian discipleship. Are we actually wanting to practice the faith that we proclaim? Will the church live its identity? Will there be a church in the 21st century that actually reflects the reality of Jesus? There was this young faculty guy at Cal that I uh, got introduced to, who had apparently been listening to our services online and uh, uh, or, or on the radio rather at the time, and who um, who knew some people that came to First Press, but he hadn't yet come to First Press. But he he listened to me pre, so he contacted me. Could we get together? So we get together, and he said <clears throat> some some things that just told me a little bit about his background, and among other things, he said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm the youngest person in my department to." ever be given tenure. I've gotten basically everything I've ever wanted academically and professionally, and I have no idea what any of it means. I have, I'm without bearing to understand why there's any consequence to what I'm doing. I have it all, and I have nothing. So that began many months of just having conversation about uh, reality itself, about philosophy and theology, and about um, the faithfulness of God in Christ. And so he was very much a church person and had yet to come to First Press. And he said, so let me just get this straight. So are you telling me that if I come to your church, I would actually meet people who are like Jesus? Now there's a question for a pastor. <laughs> oh, I see. You mean like this is real. Oh, you mean, would I actually meet people who are really living this? And gratefully, of course, I could say, yes, yes, you would meet people that are like that. We are a polyglot group of people. We are ragtime people. We are not perfect people. No, but you will meet many credible Christian people in our congregation who do not perfectly live the Christian life, but that are credible. They are credible witnesses. This is not a perfect standard. This is a standard of just credibility. When people reject the church and call the church full of hypocrites, there's not a problem about the fact that we're not perfect. That's what often Christians hear in the critique of hypocrisy. I don't think people are actually expecting the church to be perfect. I just think they want it to actually be credible. So you say you believe this? Is this actually how you live? Does it really show up in the whole of your life? Are these things actually really integrated? Do you show unexpected qualities that we might think of as the fruit of the Spirit that may not be in Paul's list, but would be things like forgiveness? Yet you just don't want to go near the church if you don't want to be near forgiving people. If you, if you want to find people that are going to hold people to a high standard, that's the kind of church I hear about. But what about the church that's just a really forgiving place, that really understands what mercy means, 
understands what it means to be really generous hearted, who nurtures in a community capacity to always see and love one another through the eyes of Jesus, that understands and sees people's uh, weaknesses and does not, in the words of Brian Stevenson, hold people responsible for the worst day they ever had or the worst thing they ever did. No, I actually see you as a whole person in naked dignity. I see the whole of you, that's fine, or as much of you as I've been able to come to know. And I'm just prepared to see you as much as I can with an ever clearer picture of who you are in Christ. Now, if the church actually lived that sort of identity, just imagine the, the freedom that would come to the body of Christ. So that at a time like this, where the church currently is racked by division, hostility, hatred, rage, condemnation, judgment, division of so many different kinds, all labels that you could easily find plenty of evidence for in so many places all around the country. Instead, the church was known as just this ebullient place that cares for people, that sees people, that loves people, that, yes, understands and knows difference, who's quite prepared to move toward people who are not like us, who may not like us, who may even be enemies of us. That's sort of the gold standard. So if the gold standard, Matthew 5, is that we're going to become people who learn to love, not just those who love us, but, uh, and, but people who may not like us, and ultimately even people who are our enemies, if that's the gold standard, then maybe what if, the, what if we gave ourselves to the task of just learning to love really irritating people? Do you know any irritating people? Are they sitting next to you? <laughs> Do they live in your house, sleep in your bed, and sit at your dining room table? Are there other people in your world who are just really irritating? Like they're kind of, you know, like really problematic people. They just are difficult people. What if we were really to learn to just love really irritating people? In the presence of uh, this company of witnesses, I want to say God has just given me an abundance of such people, really. And a, a part of the gift of being Christian is to realize I, I am called to welcome irritating people and to welcome even people who are more than irritating, like really kind of gnawing people. And I'm not really about the sociology of trying to avoid those people. I'm actually meant to engage them. At the time of 9-11 and soon after when private jet travel was incre increasingly popular um, because people wanted to reject commercial air flights because they were such a gigantic hassle already and became even more of a hassle. And so for the gazillionaires who could fly privately, apparently this was a growth industry, and uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal focused in on one kind of widget maker who was a gazillionaire and who could therefore fly privately. And he said, in the article, yeah, the difference for me all happened one day when I was flying commercially from one coast to the other. And there was, I was, of course, in first class, and there was a woman in business that had a baby that cried the whole way across the country. And I said to myself right then and there, I'm never flying commercial again. And then he gave us his mission statement, quote, because I decided that the really important thing to me is to exclude from my life anyone who might bum me out. Okay, let's just meditate on that for just a moment. <laughs> just a little bit of a mantra, because I've decided that the really important thing to me, to me, is to exclude from my life anyone who might bum me out. Now, when I first read this article, I thought, oh, that is just so disgusting. I can't even imagine saying that in public, and at least on the pages of the Wall Street Journal. And then I thought, hmm, that's sort of awkwardly familiar, really. Um, I don't do it in the form of private jet travel, but I do all kinds of things every day, including my gratitude for caller ID on my phone. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to answer you. No, I'm not, I'm not interested in talking to you right now. Like, I get to just innocently, freely disregard the irritating person. I don't want to talk to him. And it just delivers that right up to me. Watch out, I'm coming for you. No, you're not. I'm not saying yes. Now, this happens in really 
elaborate schemes, right? It defines where we live, defines where we shop, it defines who we hang out with, defines whose voices we hear, defines who we really see, whose voices actually penetrate and make a claim on us, whose understanding of things is all shaped by this. And God in Christ is wanting to move us to the freedom, not of being absorbed by everything and every person that comes in. We are finite. We are people with naked dignity, frailty, finitude, ordinariness. Okay, all those things are the graces. And to enlarge our heart and our capacity in order to be free to lean toward people because we see them in the, in the image and likeness of God and Christ. The God who sees them and paid attention to the person who shouts from the crowd, the person who doesn't, isn't seen, who isn't heard by other people, who's often dis discouraged and removed. In fact, the text I want us to look at for a few moments this morning that dwells on that is actually, hold on just a second here. It's actually a text at the beginning of, of Matthew uh, 8. So Jesus has preached the Sermon on the Mount, um, 5 through 7, amazing text about how kingdom life is going to reorder all relationships and power and allegiances. It's going to set us free to be able to do things, including even loving our enemies in a way that we could never otherwise do. How do we grow in that capacity to see, love, engage, serve in a way that is free to be able to do this? Not because every single time we must do something. That's not what, I don't want you to hear me saying that. We still have freedom. We, have, we can give priority to various things. We can give a, a prioritized ordering to the, the use of our time, all that. Amen, amen, amen to all that. But the question is, are we free? Are we free to actually really engage because we're looking at a world that is beyond ourselves? That we are not the centerpiece. This is why that declaration, that, that little liturgy that we did last night, I'm not God. You're not God. And in that is the freedom to really be clear about ultimate things. And in this case, what happens is that Jesus, having said all the amazing things that he says in the Sermon on the Mount, then concludes, as you know, with the parable of the rock and the sand. And the difference between building your house on rock and sand has to do with whether you actually do the truth. So freedom comes in doing. Does, freedom does not come in confessing. It does not come, by that I mean confessing faith. It does not come by just saying, Jesus is Lord. That's a true statement. But the freedom doesn't come with that declaration. The freedom comes by actually living into that declaration and allowing it to actually reshape our lives in whatever ways that might be needed. So in this context, Jesus says, so don't stand at the door and say, fine sermon, preacher. No, I want you to actually show that you have actually heard and believed and live the sermon. That's what I'm actually seeking. So he gives that warning, which is a pastoral warning. Don't go down from the mountain and think that if you just heard a good sermon on the mountain that you've got it. Nope. You could have gotten all of that, but now are you going to live the truth? Then the rub comes right at the very beginning in this seamless way, 8-1. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and there was a leper who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you choose... You can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him. I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And then Jesus said to him, say that, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So, here the question is, what do we do about people who s might stain us? You probably uh, primarily would know that uh, leprosy was a, obviously a, considered a highly infectious disease, was an infectious disease. You had to be ritually pure. You didn't want to encounter or touch or get near to some, too close to somebody with leprosy. Hence the necessity is required by practice that a person with leprosy needed to announce to the world throughout the day, unclean, 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 so that people would avoid having any contact. Can you imagine living in a world in that way? Unclean, unclean, unclean. I wonder how many homeless people, people who are literally in that physical sense unclean, who really live in a world where they feel as though 
their, their very life is a representation of their own sense of loss of dignity, that I am fundamentally simply unclean. That is who I am. Unclean, unclean, unclean. Imagine the courage it took to actually insert yourself before Jesus in your naked dignity and to ask Jesus to actually do something on your behalf as a proclamation of faith. If you choose, you could make me clean, an affirmation that that is actually something Jesus is capable of doing. But is that really what Jesus is going to do? And the question then becomes, how does Jesus respond? And now Jesus, remembering the sermon still echoing in his mind, don't just say the truth, but live the truth. The question is, are you going to be subject to the law of ritual purity, or are you going to be subject to the law of God's love, which is actually a capacity to engage beyond the boundaries of whatever prohibition might otherwise limit your ability, your freedom to actually love the leper. Jesus demonstrates this freedom in saying, implicitly in his actions in every way. I see you. I hear you. I am like in communion with you. He reaches out and he touches the man and the man is healed. Now, we may or may not have been given the gifts of healing. We have all kinds of abilities to make connection at the very least. But are we prepared and are we free to actually engage? Our sociology teaches us not to be. This is why I'm writing this book on fear again, because it feels to me like so much of fear has to do with miscalibrated anxiety. But we're, we're groomed by our sociology to fear various types of people, things, experiences, places, locations, all for what we might call legitimate reasons in, in certain ways, but also ways that actually blind us to other things that are actually really present, including the dignity of the person that is uh, in front of us who may be crawling out for help. And the calling out may not be, you can make me clean, but it may be another kind of calling out that just comes as a result of a kind of reaction that people have to the environment that they're in, where they're, where they're desperate or lost or confused or uncertain. And they might be your boss, frankly. It might be your colleague at work. It might be your neighbor. You don't have to be strung out on the streets and homeless to actually have a need to be touched, to be heard, to be validated, to be seen, to be engaged, to be responded to. I remember one time being caught in O'Hare Airport, and there's no place quite as special as O'Hare to be uh, somehow caught. And I was at the end of one of those long wings where it's just you know 42 gates within a 15-foot radius, it feels. There's cats of thousands. Everybody's plane has been canceled. There's no food. You're just like in this terrible place. And no one, of course, knows when flights are going. Okay, so it was that kind of a, a venue. Now, in this case, there was actually some food at the gate. And I um, had gotten some, uh, I think it was a Burger King. And I had gotten something. And I was sitting eating my burger on the thin metal edge of a moving walkway, right? Very wonderful place to just be perched like this for a long time eating this terrible burger. And so I'm, I'm watching what's happening in front of me and the, the line for Burger King is right there and there's this guy, young guy probably in his uh, late 20s, early 30s, and he's, he's just actively hitting on almost every woman who walks by him. And so I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, what a cretin. This is just unbelievable. I can't he, get with it. And then I kind of lose track of his story. And then all of a sudden I realize that he's sitting <laughs> right there. Now, Mark, Mark the introvert, Mark the I'd rather not talk to strangers kind of person, Mark who isn't looking for a confrontation, Mark who doesn't, I don't know, like a thousand other things that could have caused me not to engage him. God is expanding slowly my heart. I'm going, so is that your usual success rate? <laughs> and, he, and he said, what? I said, well, I was just, you know, you were pursuing something there in line, and I just happened to notice that you kept getting rebuffed. So I just was wondering, is that your usual style, and is that your usual success rate? He goes, yeah, that was kind of a bad day. I mean, <laughs> I... I said, you know, I think some things I could have used as lines were, and then he gave me some tips. He said, you might keep those in mind. I said, that's good, helpful, thank you. 
Glad to know that. Um, so what's your story? What are you doing? Uh, I'm flying to Las Vegas. Why are you flying to Las Vegas? Because I had a job there. Um, I said, and he said, I just can't wait to get out of here. And I said, I know it's just a pack. He goes, no, not here. I can't wait to get out of Chicago. So now that's, that's like coming from someplace. What's that about? Well, actually, this was supposed to be my wedding day. And it was going to be the case that we were going to get married and actually fly this week for us to begin our new life together. But my fiance was killed in a car accident. And now I'm just going to take this job in Las Vegas. So that's just terrible. How did she die in a car accident? We went into that. So, so do you have family here? Yes. So they've been supportive to you. No, they couldn't stand her actually. So they actually felt, I think, sort of relieved that she wasn't in part of the picture anymore. So you've lost your fiance and your family has really basically abandoned you in one of the most painful moments of your life. And now you're stuck at O'Hare talking at the moment to me and on your way to a job to do what? To be a cop, to be a cop. I got it. So you're going to be an angry, upset, distressed and depressed cop arriving in Las Vegas to serve the public good. And this led to a much longer conversation and all kinds of important things got communicated. But it gave me a chance to understand that the Cretan was actually made of so many more parts than I could have ever imagined. All of that was there. I just saw him as Cretan, like Cretan jerk in line, like get a life, stop hitting on all these women, like what's your deal? Now suddenly up comes this completely complicated, painful story. Fortunately, I knew some people in, in Las Vegas that I could put him in touch with. They did actually uh, really show up for him over the next few months as he got settled. I can't imagine, that, to my knowledge, that he came to any faith or that how much our conversation registered, I have no idea. All I know is that I was changed by a moment of just simply an encounter with somebody that I wouldn't even have known about or even thought about talking to, frankly, who now becomes a real living human being with all the reality that I have or that you have, that we have, and that is true of every human being on the planet. There's nobody for whom that scenario isn't also true. This is why the walking as Christians in the naked dignity, like, do I have it in me to be a human that's free enough to connect with another human. That's all that initial encounter was. I'm not there to be an evangelist. I'm not there to be uh, the person that's gonna give him advice about how not to hit on women in Burger King. Like, that's not my whole job. I'm just being a human being in the same space that he's in, where we're sharing this awkward, strange, physical, unexpected circumstance of possible arrangement of meeting and coming briefly to know one another. The question really is not just, of course, what happens in those temporary moments, but in the longer arc of our life. Like, are we cultivating a freedom to just be able to be present to people? Again, if you're the introvert that I am, um, these are not things that just come naturally to me. My wife is an extreme extrovert. I'm just absolutely not an extreme extrovert. <laughs> I'm not even close to extreme in, in that category. I am just happily in my own little private world of scholarship. <laughs> a quiet study with a cup of coffee and a really great book to read. Like, I'm just happy in that space. But that is just fine in its own terms. It's just not all that I'm called to. That's the minimum of who I am. The fullness of who I am we are, is not to turn everybody into extroverts. That's not the lesson I'm trying to suggest either, is to acknowledge that the question is, am I free to actually see, to actually engage, to speak, to ask a question, to be present for whatever that moment might be. Now, the harder road, is, of course, is to do this over time with a community of people or a population that we're engaged with. It's not just the single moment. That's not the high point. That's just an incidental moment. The question is, are we going to live a life of freedom where I actually want to see 
and know and hear the voices of people that are around me. This is the great privilege of Christian community. Calvin calls the church a schoolhouse. It's a schoolhouse to learn the faith, so it definitely involved content, but it's also a schoolhouse of community. How do we learn to love? The church is meant to be a community in which children and uh, young adults and full-blown adults end up discovering and growing in our capacity to commune with God and with one another. So let's just go through a super brief exercise of just thinking about the significance of, of the two sacraments, of baptism, of our baptism and the Lord's Supper. In baptism, we enter into the death of Christ and into the resurrection of Christ. And whether we have been baptized by as an infant or whether we've been baptized somewhere else along the, along the, the line, we, that, is the, that is what baptism is claiming. You are dead and you are raised. What is that for? It's for the sake of liberty, the freedom of a Christian life, the freedom of a life lived in God, where actually it's all been on the line and it was all laid down. And now it is being reborn. And what is that meant to do? It keeps us continuously engaged in saying, if I'm a baptized person, it doesn't put me in an elite special category. It puts me in a category of deep identification with the God who died and rose on our behalf. Is there anyone among us who does not know death? Not one of us does not know death. All of us know death in various ways, whether it's been our closest person or whether it's been our spouse or a child or whether it's been a stranger or, or a neighbor, whoever it might be, we know the realities of dying. And dying happens on so many levels, right? It happens emotionally. It happens psychologically. It, why is there so much mental health crisis right now? Many, many, many reasons. But one of the reasons is that we, we don't know what to do about the dying that goes on in our lives, the relationships that die, the, the feelings that die, the experiences that, of loss the estrangement that occurs, the perplexity of being overwhelmed by various challenges. What is that? That's all about dying. And we are the people who know about the dying because in our baptism, it is sealed in us that in Christ we die and are then raised to new life. So what is a baptized person like? A person who knows death and life. We walk into the world in the freedom of that. Does our baptism... Are we seeing and, and understanding and integrating the depth of our baptism into our ability to live in the world in freedom? Or the Lord's Supper, a communion of unlike people who are drawn together not because we share the same boat, the same attitude, the same life experience, the same economic background, our education, or race or ethnicity or political or social location. No, we are simply invited to this table because Jesus Christ is the host who actually sees the living and the dead and says, now come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Or in the language of the man who's now flying privately, come to me, all you who totally bum me out. I want you. I see you. I love you. I want you to walk into the world as people who live out of the Eucharistic feast that invites people as unworthy as we are to be in a communion with God and with others who are unlike ourselves, who don't share the same reality. And in that highly diverse, unexpected table, we find the language of love that names us in our neediness. Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Someone died on our behalf. Someone died on our behalf, and someone was raised on our behalf. This table is the table for any who put their trust in this reality. Come, eat, and drink. There's a church in San Francisco that I uh, have visited a number of times, St. Gregory's, and it's an amazing, highly progressive liberal congregation, and, and filled with all the eclecticism of San Francisco, just like just imagine, I don't know, amazing array of people, small little small congregation, but just amazing array of people. And 
in that church, they take communion by dancing their way from this, the sanctuary like this to the communion table that's over here, which is a high communion table. And in a very simple step way, they literally do dance with their along their aisles. Each aisle just turns this way. And then you dance your way to the communion table. And then you form a mosh pit around this, this high. So we are all like cheek and jowl right here. And over there is the communion table. And without vestments and without clarity, who it will be that will preside at the table? Eventually, one person starts the words of institution, picks up the elements and says, now, all of you who are here, without exception, are invited to eat and drink at this table. Now, for all the theology in the Reformed tradition of, quote, fencing the table, there's something about that moment which every single time just shatters me. The array of unexpected faces, needy people, brilliant, lovely, wealthy, stream poor, whatever, whoever they are, at the mosh pit of the Lord's table, who says to you, I see you, I invite you to live here at the table, and then to go from this place to live in the world. Now, interestingly, a woman who became a priest at that church, because she came as a total skeptic, an atheist, who found herself in, in this ritual that she didn't know, didn't understand, but suddenly experienced that when she put the bread in her mouth, as she wrote about extensively, God was in her mouth. A God that she didn't believe in, a God that she didn't know, a God that she wouldn't have named, but what she could experience was God was in her mouth. She came back. She's deeply converted to Christ. She becomes a priest. And she eventually starts off of that very communion table, one of the largest feeding programs in San Francisco, where it is quite literally the case that the food that people come to receive, they receive across the table. So you come to the table. It's the extension of the Lord's table into the streets of San Francisco. So if that's true of the table, the, the literal table in that case, what about those of us who have been at the table? We're meant to go and bear witness that we have been at that table and it has recast everything. So now I do walk into the world in a different way, a different set of framing for understanding who my neighbors actually are. That the God that I worship is a God who would definitely invite them to this table and is inviting them. And how would they even know that there is such a God or that that God is good or that God would want to know their name and actually does know their name and far more than just their name? How do we actually live from that table? How do we live from our baptism? How do we live out of the Lord's Supper? So let me just say that it seems to me that these are some ordinary practices that are not abstract. They're really quite tangible. They're frames of mind. They have to be practiced. They can't be something that we just sort of give a nod to and go, oh, yeah, 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 there's that. No, we actually live an embodied Christian life in the real world where there's all kinds of pain and suffering and challenge and injustice, and we are meant to be witnesses in our naked dignity that there is a God who is absolutely with the poor and present to us and to the world. That's the reality of Christian freedom. It's the freedom that says, I don't, I actually don't, I don't hold all the answers. I don't even have a fraction of the answers. What I do know is that I know a God who holds the answers to all of the questions. And I'm prepared to be as credible a witness as I can be in freedom to just point in a life of love and mercy and justice to the people uh, that are around me that there is such a God. So let me just take a moment to first give you a moment just in silence to think about what I've just been trying to reflect on. And then um, I'm going to have you do something. So let's just take a few minutes and just in quiet. Please.
But God, before we go further, I want to just ask that you would seal in our hearts whatever good news has been shared this morning and in whatever relevance it may have to anyone right now, that you would seal it in our inner heart, our being, our longing to be people who walk in freedom, not in fear, not in needless fear, not in spiraling in anxiety, not in feeling lost and disoriented, not in an overwhelming sense of despair, but in a, in a humble, naked dignity that you know and see us individually and collectively, you know and see our world. You want your people to be free agents, free agents in the world of your love and grace. Do that work. Help us practice that work, to remember that work, to pursue it in any context that we might be in. We ask it in Jesus' name. So as we did last night, I wonder if you could just turn to two or three people that are seated around you and share what you've just heard um, and something that might be worth reflecting on further in your point of view. So please turn. Let's take about five minutes to do that, and then we'll come back for some group discussion.
Another minute. Okay, let's uh, let's come back together as a group. So first, let me just say that I, I realize that I, you know, I said a lot, um, and that there are lots and lots of pieces of this that, of course, a much longer conversation would uh, benefit from. So I'm not suggesting that any of this is simple. Um, it threatens things like tidiness. So if you want to be a tidy Christian. It's not going to really be part of the Christian life too much, really. Um, it's better just to kind of die to that. Um, to, to just realize that you're not going to get control and every little thing is not going to be tied up and ambiguity is going to be removed. Not really. That's just not how it goes. So whatever work you need to do psychotherapeutically or otherwise to just kind of release on your tidiness that it needs to all be within a certain time frame and a certain ease, a simplicity, just doesn't work that way. It's just really a lot more complicated than that. Um, another thing to, that you'll have to really confront, as we all do, and I certainly do, both in tidiness and in this other category, uh, fear is just a huge thing. So what causes us to not be Christians, sometimes it's just fear, that there is greater fear about our neighbor than there is fear of God, and there's greater uh, preparedness to actually want to accommodate them to actually reflect the God that we say we want to serve and, and honor. So we have to like sort out our fears. Tomorrow in worship, I'm going to be preaching on a text that is really about sorting out fear and about how do we understand um, the prioritization of the, the greater fears and the lesser fears. How do we sort that out and let that actually clarify how we live in the world? But there's a lot of things like this that are very specific that are and unique to each of us. Um, and I would commend, actually, if you have time later today or tomorrow afternoon, for example, um, to just reflect on some of the things that we've spoken about and for you to move forward, what would some of the hurdles be and how might you consider addressing those? Might you share them with other people who could uh, hold you accountable, work together with you on that stuff? How do we find freedom? That's the goal. It's not harassing each other. It's actually supporting one another in living a free life. So um, I have some closing comments I want to make, but before we do that, let's just um, let's just see if there's any questions or reactions or comments anyone wants to offer. Yes. Yes. Coming to the Lord yes. and laying all these things before yes. Him. Yes. You might not have had time for like your Burger King. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I think. Yeah, I, I think I so appreciate that, Leslie, because I do think that one of the things that this will encompass, of course, is why we need to pray at all times, right? So, so in that moment, I don't remember specifically praying. But what I do know is that I try, as a regular growing habit, that I am trying to live a life that is a continuous act of prayer. That I'm thinking about, looking at the world, trying to understand what's happening. Oh, help me see, help me see, help me feel, help me understand, help me engage, help me be willing to be available. Like that's an ongoing prayerfulness of life that means along comes an incident and it does feel like, oh, well, this is a piece of that prayer. This is just a continuous extension of that. I've asked for this. I'm now prepared to actually live it out. I don't always do it well, don't always do it faithfully, but I try to live into that reality and prayer is absolutely the context that holds it which is really another word for the long, lifelong, every-dimensional conversation with God uh, that we're invited to experience, which is its own freedom, absolutely. Yeah. Others? Yes? Okay, 
St. Gregory because I think it really does uh, give us uh, a richer, a deeper, a broader perspective on God in community and his desire for us to be in communion and in community with people. Yeah. Well, I, I'm grateful for that. Embrace that within our uh, reform tradition. Yeah. Well, Calvin and other reformers said the church is reformed and always reforming um, according to the word of God. So um, I think it's an ongoing act. I mean, I understand why we say that the table should be fenced for those who believe. That's what that language means. It means we say, obviously, innocuously and many times without any cognitive awareness that in the words of institution you say things like now all those who put their trust in christ and are prepared to believe that this table is for them you're invited to come and eat and drink except that that's just really not the way that jesus actually treated people he didn't he almost never said first believe in me tell me that i'm lord and then you can come to the private banquet right that's just not the way that it's set up so we as with some a measure of theological stewardship, we could call it, or spiritual stewardship, or preservation of the sanctity of God and, and not wanting to be inappropriately casual or um, blind to the fact that it's the holy, righteous God that we're talking about. It's the, if it's the God of the back pocket, then I'm not sure that our saying, y'all all are welcome, is exactly what I think is happening at St. Gregory's. They're not saying y'all are welcome in that kind of like, y'all can come to the banquet. It's like, no, actually, the God that we've been honoring this morning wants you. He wants you to be at the table. Oh, don't miss the banquet. That edge is often lost in our fencing the table, um, which I'm not entirely sure uh, I would endorse in the way that I have in the past. Um, and really what I'm saying there is I'm, I'm in a process myself of trying to reflect on how do we understand that. Um, I do think God sorts it out. I don't feel like God needs me to be the sorting master, the sheep dog at the gate that says, no, you can't come in. You must come in. Like, I don't know. I'm not sure that that's really the authority that's been given to me. This is a longer conversation, but anyway, those are just some initial reactions. Yes. 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 And pass that outside his baptismal fountain. Yes. yes. And that's what they want to express. Right. Come to the table, we'll get you baptized later. Yes. Right. And, and it is, that's, thank you for saying that, because that's exactly what they are doing theologically. They're saying this is the order of things. You come to the table, you come to the water. Whereas we've decided it has to be the other way around, really. It, in the strictest understanding, not only do you have to confess th these things, but you need to have been baptized before you can come to the table. And depending on what other part of the Christian tradition you might be in, you may have needed to go to confession, or you know, it becomes a really elaborate theological um, drama of how we come eventually to the table. But at St. Gregory's, you just come in the door, <laughs> and there's the table. So you've been there, and I'm glad. Yeah, thank you. Yes? Yes. Prayer and large Yeah. And I'm thinking about you in that um, wonderful term moment. Yes. You have an appointment with that. Yeah. Until probably other Christians people. Right, right. And yet, somehow, you know, I'm the Holy Spirit works. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, we, we have those appointments because just like Jesus didn't heal everybody. Right. Um, we have to be yes. Right. 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 Too much. We want to dump the whole salt shaker on somebody. Um, and that is just not really ever a good idea. Um, and I do think that Pascal, uh, Pascal's words echo Mother Teresa's or the other way around. Um, and that is that you, we should do great things as if they're small because of Jesus Christ. 
And we should do small things as if they're great because of Jesus Christ. That encompasses the range, obviously, of our experience. And, and the sense that we're doing these things, we're doing life in the name of Christ. That doesn't mean that name has to be perpetually on our tongue as though it's every second or third word that we use. It is the embodiment of the reality. This is where I think salt is meant to awaken thirst. The church has tended to think of itself as wanting to slake thirst, to satisfy thirst. But the image of salt is actually more like an awakening of thirst, like being ever more thirsty because of being around people who are salty. I'm really thirsty, thirsty, thirsty for the reality of God. Is our church life and is our human ordinary life a daily witness to, to a God who intensifies our thirst for more, not in a consumeristic way, but in a deeper and more grounded and more comprehensive um, way? Other questions or comments in moments to offer? Yes. Yes. But um, and it reminds me of you know studying with James Torrance. He knew very well about because he was Scottish, you know, right. the, the fence table. But he was 180 degrees the opposite. Of yes. Him. And it's converting ordinance. Let the people come. Right. Right. So that's just a beautiful. Yes. Insight. It is. And I, I thank you for that example yeah. of that being a conversion. Right? Yeah. Uh, right. Fence table. You know. Who's good enough to go to the table? Right. Like, Nobody's good enough to go to the table. Right. That's right. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. The pain of my ecumenical experience is heightened by the fact that I used to take communion with my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. And now the bishop here in Santa Rosa has found out about what we were doing up there in, in Humboldt and the hinterlands. And they we can't do it anymore. So we have to separate the table. Mm -hmm. And I have any thoughts about how we can have that deep communion, even though mm -hmm. we have to respect their understanding yes. and honor that, but we're, we're, we can't come to their table. Right. Even if they can come to ours, we can't go to theirs. Right. And, and they shouldn't come to ours. I don't want to. Anyway, I just wonder if they have any thoughts on it. Bad and just to open up a big can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to like open up a universe right there. Um, so, uh, yes, to all that. Um, I've had similar and, and shared experiences like that that are very, very um, difficult. You're yearning for something that structurally, theologically, ecclesially is very, very hard to accomplish. Um, and if you add still further diversity to that, with you, you add the Orthodox Church on the one hand, or um, extreme Pentecostal services on the other, you end up having, or in churches where communion is picked up at the back on the way in, in a little plastic combination of bread, wafer, and cup, part of COVID, I realized that was, a, I would call that a special season. Not, not normative to the body of Christ and its experience of the Lord's Supper. You pick up a little piece of plastic at the door, and then at the moment, whenever you're ready, as I've been in many churches that say, whenever you want to over the service, just take communion. Go. Oh my gosh, I can barely breathe. Not, be, not because I'm not wanting to acknowledge that in every morsel of life, I can experience the presence of God in the, in the feast, but because it's a it, it feels like literally casting your bread in a way that is disregarding the body and blood of Christ. This is why we fence the table, because the language is not of, of, of guarding the Holy of Holies, but of trying to say, I want to honor in the fullness of the reality of what it, the mystery that God should be in the bread and the wine, and that we should somehow find God in one another uh, and our neighbor and our world in that combination. So... I, I hear your your words, Dan. I don't have probably more than that that I think I can say today, but it is a, an absolutely important part of all that we're talking about. And even for having two congregations join. Um, so often what forms churches 
is a preference around issues of, of the sacraments as well as other things. And that can be the source of unity, which is what it's meant to be, or it can often be the place of fracture lines that um, to build a, the church. So, yeah. Great. I look forward to it. Great, please. Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We will come hungry. Other comments or questions? Anyone else? Yes. Yes, I'm good. Go ahead. Over here. I work with uh, college students. I think a lot of, have a lot of trauma. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're looking at the church and all the brokenness. Um, and so as you talk about forgiveness, I was also wondering, like, what would it look like for a church to also reflect Jesus' boundaries? Yes. On what is appropriate or inappropriate. Right. Behavior? Right. That could also be a, a witness. Yes. 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 Only Forgiveness. Right. How do we Yeah. 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 I'm I'm working right now with a bunch of theological leaders uh, around the world designing a curriculum around um, for seminaries and colleges and churches uh, around sexual abuse and sexual harassment as an example. So that's just one category of these sorts of issues. And in those conversations, of course, it's extremely important that we're talking about and developing in the curriculum the kind of accountability and so forth. I think, and I have lots of friends like you're describing, and I think that the younger generations are really, again, not expecting a perfect church. They're just expecting a credible church that takes sin and brokenness and everything else in between just seriously enough to actually respond to it. And that means boundaries in some instances. And it means saying no and not just saying yes. It does mean extending grace to all, but grace doesn't look the same when the first line of grace may be forgiveness and mercy, but it, the consequences of behavior need to be taken with appropriate seriousness, and the safety of other people need to be taken appropriately. And the gospel actually holds all those things together. But the inauthenticity of the church is that we hide the sin or the brokenness, then suddenly it gets exposed, and then it's like the whole thing's a fraudulent exercise, and then it's only added to by the fact that then the church handles it so badly that still further people, and almost always it's the victims, who end up with still greater anxiety, fear, depression, disorientation, misalignment in the church. Yeah, it's a huge thing, so amen to that. This is where, but you have to be free to do that, right? The freedom of that is, is not the freedom to be a judge. The freedom to that is to take our lives and our actions as a community and individually with full seriousness and tentatively and humbly in the name of Christ to go to perpetrators and others and really acknowledge what that actually really means, what it's cost, what are the re what steps need to be taken. Um, healing may be the eventual trajectory, but along the way, there's a lot of other things that need to happen uh, that are not about just there, there, let's all be quiet and it'll go away. That's actually far worse, of course. Yeah. It's the authenticity of that freedom, but we can't get there if we're not free. Um, we, or the likelihood that we will get there is just really diminished if we're not actually free. Someone over here, I think. Yes. My father and mother separated when I was 14, divorced when I was 18. My father remarried. Uh, I was raised in the Catholic tradition. And we were in church one Sunday, and we were kneeling as a cousin Mary, time, and he was crying. And he said, Steve, he said, I can't receive communion because in so many words I've been excommunicated. And I, I told him, I said, Dad, I said, if you want to receive communion, you go up to the communion rail, and you receive communion. That's between you and God. And what you just described for us in, in the context of um, I worship in a Presbyterian church. I consider myself a Christian. I don't consider myself a denomination. Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian. Yeah. Uh, if um, a church says that you're not welcome at, the, at that altar, to me, the altar's not Christ's table anymore. Mm -hmm. It's that church's mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. And so my, my thinking is that if a person is in a communal situation and the gospel is preached, mm -hmm. 
don't deal with the context of whether you should receive communion or not. Mm -hmm. You go to the rail. Mm -hmm. If somebody refuses mm -hmm. to serve you because they know something about you that in their mind mm -hmm. uh, tells them that you're not worthy or whatever, that's on them. Mm -hmm. And if somebody observes that, and it leads to that conversation, and they, they start to think about it, mm -hmm. it really isn't the table about this church. Mm -hmm. That's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then maybe change will come out of that. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess the reason I share what I share is I'm interested in how you think about a person who has been told because they're not of that faith or whatever. They just accept that and they mm -hmm. don't know. Right. Well, this is back to the question that we were hearing a moment ago from Dan. Um, so let me just say that my own view is probably parallel to yours. So I'm, I'm in the camp of, of exercising the freedom with, while acknowledging um, that to some degree, it's, it's a little too privatized and it's a little too personalized, a little too individualized to go fully down the road that you're describing. So I'm finding myself hugely identifying with what you're saying and also feeling caution. Um, now, let me express my caution in a couple different ways. Let's let's imagine that you were talking potentially about a Roman Catholic church. And if you were talking about a Roman Catholic church, what is the church believing it's doing? It does not believe that what it's doing is wrongly barring people like a judgment bar. That's not how the Roman Catholics would understand what they're doing. They're saying, we believe that the table uh, prepares or uh, requires a preparedness, which is of many different sorts. And we think that is what the Lord intended. And we, as the church, are not intervening. We've actually been put in the place of being the steward of the elements that then feed God's people through baptism and all the sacraments that the Roman Catholic Church names, right? Now, I don't accept that understanding of the role of the church. I'm a low church guy. I really, you know, primarily a communion of people stumbling into the, the reality of God and God's life and meaning and presence in the world. And I'm connected to other people who are on that journey together. I'm very low church. Um, and at the same time, I don't want to dismiss that Roman Catholic vision, for example, that would land in a space that you're describing as being abusive. Can it be abusive? Yes. Can it be? But it's unfair to actually say to them that they're simply wrong about that. I would just say that is not the part of the Christian tradition that I'm prepared to walk in. And my freedom is, I'm going to consider you as brothers and sisters of Christ. And so I've often attended and taken communion at Roman Catholic churches. And I've done so in the in the in what I've embodied as the Christian liberty of believing this table belongs to me as much as to anyone else in the room. And then I've had seasons when I thought, no way am I going up there. That just feels like a, I'm not actually welcomed by their terms. And secondly, I may be more gracious, like what I would call, literally this is an audacious statement to make as a low church Protestant against the Roman Catholic Church, but um, that I think they are the weaker brother when it comes to the question of having scruples over things that I do not think need and require their scruples. I don't share in their scruples, but like Paul's response to the weaker brother, who doesn't want to eat meat offered to idols, I want to acknowledge that they are free to have that conviction. Right? So it feels like it's something like that stew pot that I just expressed that I think we're trying to hold on to. Uh, let me just share uh, one closing story and then um, a prayer. So one day in Berkeley, I was uh, just doing whatever I was doing. And I get this uh, call from this woman who seemed pretty anxious, not someone I knew, doesn't, didn't go to the church, heard about uh, me, heard about First Press, and she, and she said, look, um, I, I really want to talk to you, and, um, but there would be certain expectations I have about our meeting that you'd have to meet and guarantee that you're going to meet in order for, for me to be willing to meet with you. I said, okay, well, shoot, like what are they? So she said, well, we'd have to meet outside We'd have to meet in a public space. I wouldn't want to be on the church property. I'd need to be able to pace and swear and smoke. And uh, and I would, and she kind of went on like this. I said, well, maybe just one little thing first. 
do you have a gun? <laughs> and she said, um, she said, well, she slightly chuckled, and then she said, well, um, I don't intend to. So I thought that was as, probably as good as I was going to get. So we, we met at a nearby park, and within just moments, out comes this torrent of toxins in her being. Oh my gosh, so overwhelming. She would never want to sit on the same park bench that I was on, so she would sit on that park bench over there, and I would sit on this one. Sometimes she was willing to get sort of close, like as in like 15 feet, but otherwise, she was just dealing with an enormous amount of understandable trauma, and she was trying to understand whether any of this was possible. Could there be any liberty from this, from this horrible set of circumstances that she'd found herself in? And so that led to me a number of times, and, um, and eventually she said, so I guess what I'm really asking, is there a God in the universe that actually cares about me and can do anything about this mess? We started talking about that. We were going to continue that at the next meeting. The next meeting comes, I appear, she doesn't appear, I wait, wait, doesn't appear, doesn't appear, doesn't appear. And I tried to track down, I, didn't, I had her address, so I went there. No one lived there anymore. Uh, the neighbors said that the person had left. No forwarding address or contact information. Um, it was not during call waiting, uh, call ID or caller ID days. So I had no phone track of actually where she was. We had just communicated through email and she wasn't responding. So over the course of months, which turned into years, I lost track of her completely. I never forgot her because it was a story, you know, unfolding in real time. And she was just gone. So, but I kept her in mind when the internet was invented, so this is all pre that, the internet, she was one of the first people I typed into Google to see if I could find any evidence of where she might be. She had a somewhat unusual name. No, 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 multiple times over what turned out to be about 25 years. Then one day, I've newly arrived at Fuller to be on the faculty, and I'm in a coffee shop nearby the campus, and I, like many coffee shops that have changed jars and donation jars, this had a donation jar. And next to it was a long write-up about Burma, Myanmar, which happens to be a place that I know a fair amount about. And so I read this description and the appeal. And then I saw, and then it said, if you want more information, contact. And it gave an, a, an email address that had the right first and last initial, the first initial and the last name. And because it was unusual enough, I was like, whoa, could that actually be this person? So I immediately uh, sent her a text and said, I don't know if, if you're this person or not. I don't know where you are, um, but would you happen to be a person that maybe I would have known in Berkeley, kind of referred very obliquely <laughs> to these meetings, thinking I don't want to get it too involved in the story if it's not the person. And within about two hours, she writes back. She said, that's me. I, and she said, oh, of course, I definitely remember our meetings. I said, well, then, where are you? She said, well, I, I, right now I'm in the Sierras, but I live in Pasadena. You live in Pasadena. Why do you live in Pasadena? Because I'm a student at Fuller Theological <laughs> Seminary. So within, a, a, you know, she gets back, and we almost immediately have this extraordinary reunion. And her journey was a journey toward freedom. And it was a journey that had begun to some shifting. She needed to leave Berkeley. Lots of people need to leave Berkeley, but <laughs> she needed to leave Berkeley for sure. And, um, and she, by the grace of God, found her way to come to know God in Christ, to find release from the burden and the bondage that she felt she was really caught in. And she had been living for the last uh, almost 20 years by that stage in Burma, serving women and girls in some of the most vulnerable uh, contexts in the mountain tribes without any identification, no land, no, no legal rights whatsoever. And she had done all this because she had been set free. And the story of her telling me this was just this unbelievable journey that we've been talking about last night and again this morning. We don't have to end up in Burma, but what I can tell you is that the God who knows you wants you to be free.
to be able to love in freedom people like and unlike you, and to do so with joy and with hope, not with a heaviness as though you are really responsible for the world. Hallelujah, we have been delivered. We only need one Savior, and we have them. But we are meant to live with that kind of freedom. This person was an incarnation of that. I could tell you many, many such stories. I bet many stories like that exist in this room, where the story from bondage or slavery or death toward life and liberty and freedom and love is really the great journey. So in a moment where everything everywhere all at once is happening and we feel so disempowered and we feel so scrambled, what we've been trying to do last night and today is to say, no, but no, 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 but wait, 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 just a minute. Before we go push the panic button, get lost in despair, decide to resign, decide to close our eyes and shelter in. No, 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 we find our life in Christ and live it in naked, with naked dignity, in vulnerability in other words, and with the dignity of being made in God's image, and with the freedom together to love Santa Rosa, to love our family, to love our neighbors, to walk and care for the people who are the most needy. And that, that journey is the Christian life. And I'm just grateful that we've had some time to reflect on it together. Let's pray. Oh God, you know what um, you have wanted to say to every person in this room. You know what you're trying to say to us collectively. And so we just come to you again and give thanks that you are that kind of shepherd and friend, that you tend us, you want us to be free. May we be free in Christ, not only for our own sake, but even more for the sake of our neighbor and particularly the neighbors that we may not yet know or like or want to be near. And may we find your love and joy and celebration of unlikely people just as unlikely as ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, O oh God. In Jesus' name. Okay, and I've got just a couple of quick things, but um, first, would you just thank our low church Protestant friend? <laughs> so, so much to chew on, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, so tomorrow, uh, two services, first prayers, I think I have them now, 9 and 10.30. The 1030 is the one uh, that has, for, especially for you coasters, that has children's programming going. And after the 1030 service, there also is a little reception, uh, which also reminds me, um, nobody's like, like we're ending, but nobody's kicking you out of here. So if you want to linger, there is a lot of food and coffee still over there, and you're welcome to just hang around and talk. Um, thanks so much, and we will see you tomorrow.